Hey, uh. we're in Ballarat and this is Peter. Peter subscribes to all the Symmetry channels, uh, Serenity Sue and GV and also me and he's coming to show me around his local cemetery at Ballarat. It's a lot of history. Um, we'll tell you a bit about the Eureka Stockade later and Peter knows a lot about the history here too so we're going to follow him today <laughs> and um, he's going to show us around so stay tuned and I hope you enjoy. The colony of Victoria is the name of the body that governed Victoria from 1851 until Federation in 1901 when it became the state government of Victoria. Before 1851, the colony of Victoria was a district of New South Wales, known as the Port Phillip District. In 1851, Port Phillip District separated from New South Wales and renamed itself the colony of Victoria. As a result of this, a legislative council was formed to govern the new colony of Victoria. The first legislative council consisted of 30 men, 10 appointed directly by the new appointed Lieutenant Governor of the Colony of Victoria, Charles Latrobe. The remaining 20 men, no women were allowed, were elected to office by wealthy landowners. At this point in time, only people who owned a significant amount of land were allowed to vote. So on February 12, 1851, a prospector discovered flecks of gold in a waterhole near Bathurst, New South Wales, Australia. Soon even more gold was discovered in what would become the neighbouring state of Victoria. This began the Australian gold rush, which had a profound impact on the country's national identity. So we're in the Eureka diggers section and I'll talk about the Eureka stockade later. There was a big event that happened here in history and this town is known and a lot of the towns around it known for gold mining. And um, these guys, the diggers here, they would have been the ones that, you know, families that worked in the gold mines and in the gold mining towns. So they would have been the early pioneers. And I'll read what tombstones I can because a lot of them are faded. But this one's Mary, beloved wife of Thomas Cohen, who died August 17, 1883, aged 43 years. Her words were words of wisdom and her lips the law of peace. And Thomas Cohen, who died the 13th of May, 1887, aged 61 years. The spirit shall return unto God who gave it. And it's a beautiful big headstone. I love the fence, the wrought iron fence. A lot of them here have got those fences. So how beautiful is that? Oh, now here we have Thomas Anthony. Uh, born Coy Church, Wales, 1831. And he died in the Polands, 1907. And the pollens is just out of Ballarat, down the south. And we also have Elizabeth Banner Anthony, born Milford Haven, 1834, died Hawthorne, 1922. Now they arrived on Aus in Australia on the Great Britain, 24th of the 12th, 1861. So yeah. they were immigrants, early immigrants. So there we go. Yeah immigrated to the gold. Yeah, a lot of them did. Uh, they came out. And this gorgeous pillar one here. This is erected to the memory of Margaret Stuart Robertson, who died the 23rd of January 1893, aged 69 years. And her beloved husband, John Robertson, who died the 6th of November 1893, aged 70 years. So they died the same year and it says nothing in my hand I bring simply to the cross I cling. Also their children John Thomas who died 18th of April 1861 aged 18 months and Helen who died the 22nd of August 
five, aged 11. It's very sad that they lost their kids so young. And this grand cross here, um, you've got in memoriam of William Henderson, uh, first minister of St Andrews Kirk, Ballarat, uh, died the 22nd of July 1884, aged 57. But yeah, what a beautiful monument. This monument's um, dedicated to the soldiers here of the Eureka area and Ballarat. So, and it says this monument and enclosing fence was erected by Anno Domini, and it's a Roman numeral, um, by the government of Victoria at the request of the citizens of Ballarat. I know X is main 10 sure in the other letters but I'll look them up and I'll put the right number down. soldiers, Henry Christopher Wise, Captain Michael Roney and Joseph Wall, Privates of the 40th Regiment, and William Webb, Felix Boyle and John Hall, Privates of the 12th Regiment, who fell dead or fatally wounded at the Eureka Stockade, in brave devotion to duty on Sunday the 3rd of December 1854, whilst attacking a band of aggrieved diggers in arms against they regarded as a tyrannous administration. Not far west from this spot lie the remains of some of the diggers who fell in their courageous but misdirected endeavour to secure the freedom which soon afterwards came in the form of manhood suffrage and constitutional government. And there is a few little graves here that we are Lichen's really gotten to a lot of the stones here, but we'll go to what's clear. This is in memory of the beloved children of John and Ellen Neal, uh, Corporal in Her Majesty's 40th Regiment. Fanny died March the 19th, 1857, aged three years and eight months. Agnes died April the 10th. 1857, aged one year and four months. May they rest in peace, of course. Rest in peace, little ones. And this one's to the memory of Captain uh, Little Hales, the 12th Regiment, who died February the 12th, 1855, aged 29 years and nine months. So privates William Webb and Felix Boyle, who died from the effects of gunshot wounds received in discharge of duty on the 3rd of December 1854. Also of Private John Hall who died December the 31st 1854. So this would be a mass grave here to all of the soldiers. Now here we have the memory of James Scovey who met with a premature death on Eureka, October 7, 1854, erected by his brother George. Now, James Scovey was suspected of having been involved in the death of a miner, and I believe quite a few miners turned up, and they eventually set uh, fire to the pub that he owned, and from there the Eureka Rebellion sort of escalated. And around here, we have his brother, the family, in memory of George Scovey, he died the 13th of November 1874, aged 45. Also his beloved wife Phoebe, died 19th of October 1899, aged 66. Their dear children, James, 
Died 15th of January 1868, aged 13 months. Phoebe died 9th of March 1882, aged 20 years at rest. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. And you were saying how this James Scobie was um, copying retaliation. Well, they suspected him of in the death of a miner. Uh, I don't know whether the miner went to his pub and got drunk or whatever, but the miners were outraged and of course things were bubbling by then, you know, like a call, it was starting to get really, uh, and I don't, I don't know whether Peter Layla was there then, but he eventually got erected, uh, elected as the leader, of course being from Ireland, <laughs> you know, and he eventually uh, led the miners. And when the battle was over, he escaped. He lost an arm, but he eventually got uh, elected to the Legislative Assembly in Victoria. So, he, and he's buried in Melbourne. Now, I think the mine. So, this beautiful pillar here is the memorial to all the diggers that some of them were killed in the stockade. And it's just sacred to the memory those who fell on the memorial 3rd, 3rd of December 1854 in resisting the unconstitution of proceeding of the Victorian government this monument was presented by James Leggett um, says Geelong to the people of Ballarat and by them erected on the March 1856 and there's names on the other side so I do have a can and here we've got John Hines uh, from County Clare Island Patrick Gittens County Kirk Kenny Island Thomas Mullen, County Kirkkenny Island, Samuel Green from England, um, and it says uh, Junior or Joseph Robinson, Scotland, um, Edward Troney Thonan, and he was from Prussia, and John Haffel, and he was from Nuremberg, John Diamond from County Clare Island. Thomas O'Neill from County Kilkenny Island and John Doherty from County Donegal Island and for the Irish people that watch my channel I know my pronunciation's terrible but um, it's a very sad event and here in this lovely vault that erected by Henry Smith to the memory of his beloved wife Mary Ann who departed this life December the 6th 1864 aged 42 years and uh, base not by thyself off to the narrow of thou knowest not what a day may bring forth Proverbs and there's some more writing on the side Henry Edgar, son of Henry and Mary Ann Smith, died the 21st of March 1929, aged 74 years at rest. Loving memory of Lucy Emily, the beloved wife of Henry Smith, who departed this life 8th of July 1907, aged 62. And with it, mourn those angel faces smile, which I have loved long since, at least a while. So here, um, Peter showed me this beautiful big tombstone, told me this guy was a Scotsman that settled in the early days, Neil McNeil, born in Dingwall, Scotland, Scotland, 21st of November 1827, died at McRowan, 31st of December 1915, also his children, Thomas and William, who died in infancy, Elizabeth, wife of Neil McNeil, died the 26th of August 1924 aged 88 and um, Peter was also explaining that 
you know a lot of the earlier days they didn't have the medicine that we do now and Spanish flu took a lot of the young ones and people in the area cemetery out on this one's just gorgeous you got the big vase and then you've got the wings with the hourglass upside down and um, it's in memory of John Chalmers native of Mabel Ayrshire from Scotland died 20th of June 1871 age 47 Agnes Chalmers died the 19th of April 1907. There is some stuff on the side. I'm going to try not to step on this person's brain. Um, oh, David, eldest son of John and Agnes Chalmers, died the 9th of August 18. Is it 56 or 66? 86. 18, 86. Okay. Age 23, and their daughter Annie. Died the 4th of April 1862, only 14 months. And I noticed this big family plot here, Webb. And you've got loving memory of Emily Maud Webb. Um, died the 6th of April 1973, aged 82 years. George Richard Pike Webb died 18th of September 1966, aged 78 years. I noticed Webb was the surname of one of the fallen soldiers, so they could be descendants of that person. So here the stone's just legible. We know that it's someone called Michael and he died October was it 1865 or something. But um, just look at his tombstone or his monument and you've got this beautiful gate and the fence. I uh, just thought I'd show you guys because I just love the designs on it. It's very unusual. many nice tombstones here and some aren't legible but some are and I really like the design of the bars on this one and um, it says erected by Catherine in memory of her dearly beloved husband James Kennedy late of County Tipperary Island who was killed at Flemington, Flemington Railway Station by the wheel of a railway carriage passing overhead was it over um, on the 6th of November 1873 so how sad's that it's awful aged 41 years also their son John Thomas who died November the 15th 1868 aged one year and 11 months may their souls rest in peace also the above Catherine Kennedy died the 1st of May 1916 aged 71 Rest in peace. Their beloved daughter Mary Ann Kennedy died the 12th of February 1922, aged 48. How sad's that? That poor woman had to um, live with the memories of losing, you know, her son and her husband like that. And then um, I'm just happy that they're all together again, hopefully at rest. It's, uh, yeah. So this one says in memory of the Eureka Cullinans, Thomas 1862, Michael 1867, John 1885 and Bridget 1897, Patrick 1902 buried at Kew, Rebels in the Stockade December 3 1854, also buried here their parents John 1866 Catherine 1886 and John Infant 1867 
erected by the descendants of Patrick and Michael, 2006. Now, Housing. Sophia arrived as a widow with six children at Adelaide on the 9th of December 1849 in the ship Pauline from Germany. Finally settling at Ballarat, she started a dynasty which at 8, 1989 embraced seven generations of the Ballhausen three families, Tenkard, Norton and Dunman, families by whom this memorial was gratefully erected. So that's quite unusual. It would have been hard to start off life with six young children. So this one says in remembrance of Thomas J uh, James and he died on the 4th of oh, 1910. No, I don't know which was it. Month that is. Aged 54. And his beloved wife Eliza uh, died the 26th of June 1921, age 68. I just wanted to show you the cemetery out of the bird, and there's like a little bird there. And we bumped into a lady walking through the cemetery, and she told us to look this one up. So, Peter Finton Layla, born on the 5th of February 1827 and he died on the 9th of February 1889, was an Irish-Australian rebel and later politician who rose to fame for his leading role in the Eureka Rebellion, an event controversially identified with the birth of democracy in Australia. So the agitation against the Goldfields licences, which were 30 shillings each, began at Bendigo in 1853 and was quickly taken up at Ballarat and a reform league was formed amongst the diggers on the various gold fields for the redress of grievances. In October 1854, the government ordered the police to go out hunting for unlicensed diggers two times a week and the rumours were that they were quite rough with the diggers. So the colonial governments in Melbourne and Sydney imposed a licence fee to dig for gold. This licence gave a miner the right to peg out a small claim of 8 feet square. Licences helped the government keep track of the large number of people moving to the gold fields. They also raised money to pay for the roads, administration and police. From the start, miners complained that the licence was expensive and unfair since they were required to pay whether they found gold or not. They also felt it was unreasonable that miners were taxed when they were not represented in the government. Because they did not own the land, the majority of the diggers did not have the right to vote or to stand for election to Victoria's Legislative Council. Disaffection grew as the fees rose and policy methods became more punitive. Gold commissioners, assisted by police, conducted regular licence hunts, often treating miners with cruelty and contempt. Assistant Commissioner Armstrong was said to beat diggers unconscious with the brass knob of his riding crop. In the later half of 1854, a digger named James Scobie was killed in a scuffle at the Eureka Hotel on Specimen Hill. Bentley, who was the publican, was considered by the diggers to have participated in the murder. He and others were charged with the murder and arrested, but with the police court they were discharged. An indignation meeting was held at Ballarat on the 17th of October, close to the spot where Scobie was killed. At this meeting, a committee was appointed, of which Peter Layla was one. The authorities, fearing that the meeting might lead to an attack on Bentley's hotel, sent police to act as guard over it. A youth threw a stone at the lamp in front of the building, breaking the glass. That act of violence was a spark, with cries of, Down with the house and burn it! 
The angry mob stormed the hotel and set fire to it. Three people were arrested and charged with the act of incendiarism and were committed and imprisoned. A mass meeting was held on Bakery Hill for the 11th of November 1854 to demand the release of the alleged perpetrators. It also passed resolutions affirming the right for the people to full representation, manhood suffrage, the abolition of property qualification for members, payment of members, short parliaments and the abolition of coal commission and the diggers licences. Bentley, in the meantime, had been re-arrested on the advice of the Attorney General William Starwell for the murder of Scobie and convicted. He was sentenced to three years on the roads. On the 29th of November, a meeting of about 12,000 men were held at Ballarat. This is said to be the first public meeting that Mr Layla addressed. He moved one of the resolutions submitted and passed. It called for a meeting of the Reform League, for the following Sunday to elect a central committee. The insurgent flag was hoisted on the platform. The flag represented the Southern Cross constellation. One of the resolutions passed at the meeting declared that the licensee fee to be an unjustifiable imposition. A bonfire was soon kindled and licenses burnt. At this meeting, the rebellion was formally inaugurated. When the flag was raised, Layla led the pledge, we swear by the Southern Cross to stand truly by each other and fight to defend our rights and liberties. Layla led the miners' opposition against the incompetent and often brutal administration of the goldfields and was elected to lead the men in the armed uprising after the meeting of Bakery Hill. The diggers formed a barricade where they were attacked by troops and police on the 3rd of December. Layla was seriously wounded in the left arm, resulting in its amputation. A warrant for Layla's arrest on charges of sedition was initially sought, but he was taken from Ballarat and hidden by his supporters at South Geelong. The warrant was withdrawn in June 1855 after juries had found 13 other ringleaders not guilty of sedition. As a result of the uprising, a number of the miners' complaints were resolved. Legislation was passed to give miners the right to vote. A new form of licensing of miners' rights costing £1 per year was introduced. The monthly gold tax was abolished. A general amnesty for three miners arrested after Bentley's Eureka Hotel fire and the 114 arrested at the Eureka Stockade was proclaimed. Hey guys. Hi. Um, thank you for watching this episode and a big thank you here for Peter meeting us. Yep. He gave me two lovely books on the Eureka Stockade. Um, it's just been really, really fun. And... Um, enjoy exploring the cemeteries of his town so um yeah, stay, stay tuned. tuned to our next adventure yep we're in victoria it's very cold windy and yeah ballarat's welcoming us it's going to start yep. to rain yeah, you wouldn't soon. believe it guys <laughs> it's that cold i'm in a pair of shorts <laughs> so that's just typical of me <laughs> <laughs> hey guys we'll talk soon yeah god bless <laughs>